Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show from Ferguson Marine here in Port Glasgow on the Lower Clyde. In this, the last of our series on British shipbuilding, we look at this potential phoenix rising from the ashes of British shipbuilding. Can a yard saved from receivership in 2014 be part of a bigger, brighter future for the industry? In our first two programmes in this series, we've looked at the credibility of Sir John Parker's strategy for shipbuilding and in particular, whether the government is committed to supplying the drumbeat of military orders which will provide the base load which will enable the large to launch competitive bids into a world commercial shipping market where the order book now tops $250 billion. Here in Ferguson Marine Engineering, they've been living the dream of a revival in shipbuilding over the last four years with an investment programme designed to make them competitive in the commercial ferry market at home and abroad and the successful launch of the first of their new dual fuel ferries, the MV Glen Sanox. Today we look at how this wonderful yard was saved from closure and speak to the management and the staff about their hopes and dreams for the future. So let's have a look at this week's tweets, emails and messages. And first up this week is a statement from the Ministry of Defence reacting to the first programme in this series. They say, all our warships are built in the UK and with the tight 26 frigates securing 4,000 jobs and 20 years of work in Scotland and British industry preparing to bid for a new Type 31 E-Class, we are witnessing a renaissance in national shipbuilding. Since 2010, this government has invested more than £6 billion in shipbuilding in the UK, securing thousands of jobs. And 2018-19, we expect to spend in excess of £750 million supporting the fleet. Uh, and then uh, an email in from Tim Bevan, who's been catching up on the, on the shows online. It strikes me how interesting your choice of interview ease is, from a very timely interview with Carlos Puigdemont, the president as was of Catalonia, a fascinating president of Lebanon, recently a trio of very important people from Ireland and Northern Ireland. And that's a timely reminder, Tim, that you can catch up with all the Alex Salmon shows online. Uh, and then from Hilda, who's emailed us to, in response to our request for suggestions in future shows, Hilda suggests weaving and points out that Scotland's weaving connections around the globe, and particularly in rural Scotland, is a traditional skill, but still a very important one. And then a, an email, I think, from India, from, from Stephen Keefe, who, who says, it wishes us continued success with the RT show, a breath of fresh air, and thanks everyone involved. Thank you for that, uh, Stephen. And finally this week from Patrick from Glasgow who's tweeted to say that Scotland and Glasgow generally need to be competitive with the rest of the world and stop standing by the traffic lights with a cardboard sign and an empty coffee cup. Innovate, be creative or die. That is evolution, says Patrick. Well, Patrick, I'm not absolutely sure what all of that means, but it sounds good and that's why we included it in this week's show. As First Minister of Scotland back in 2014, I was closely involved with the rescue of Ferguson's end. If the yard had gone down, it had marked the end of shipbuilding in the Lower Clyde. But Scottish entrepreneur Jim McCall stepped in and the investment plan shows a totally different perspective. In a minute, I'll be talking to Chief Executive Jerry Marshall about Ferguson's plans for the future. But first, as Mina speaks to local member of the Scottish Parliament, Stuart McMillan, to ask what it means for the town to have a working shipyard in its midst. Welcome, Stuart. Hi, Tasmina. Tell me a bit about the town. Uh, Port Glasgow has a, a very rich heritage uh, of uh, shipbuilding, uh, as you'll be aware, and uh, it certainly also has a future for shipbuilding. I mean, we're standing here in uh, Ferguson Marine in the town. It's uh, went through some tough times, particularly 2014. That was when the yard went into receivership. But uh, it's like a, it's like a, a phoenix ashing, uh, rising uh, from the flames uh, with, um, with also this Glen Sanox behind us. And uh, this is the, well, the, the first of two of the larger vessels that have, been, uh, that have been built and also just after the three hybrid ferries that this yard built in recent years. It's, um, so there's a bright future ahead for Ferguson Marine. Of course you were involved at the time at 2014, you were the rep parliamentary representative when there were the difficulties here. How did the community feel at that time? What, what was the impact on them when there was a period of unrest? When the, when the news broke that the yard went into receivership, uh, there was a, a sense of loss. It was like a, a loss of a family member because everyone has got so much pride and passion about shipbuilding in Port Glasgow. And there's also that sense of accomplishment when you see the, the ship going, uh, going down, the, uh, down the stocks when it's been launched. Uh, there's that, that, that pride is there. And I know that's something that's been used uh, in this series uh, of shipbuilding uh, programmes that you've been doing. That's a word that comes up time and time again. This town very much 
lives and breathes shipbuilding. And uh, it was a terrible uh, period of time. However, uh, with, uh, I mean, with uh, the former First Minister, Alex uh, Salmond, um, setting up the task force uh, to make sure that, uh, that shipbuilding would once again return to the town and also return to the Lower Clyde, then that certainly was a, was a huge, huge boost uh, to making sure that shipbuilding uh, would, uh, would continue in this, in this town. And it's great to see that the, all the work that's being done and continues to be done here at, at Ferguson Marine. You, of course, have family connections to shipbuilding. Tell me a bit about that, Stuart. I do. It's, uh, this was the, the last yard that my father worked in uh, before he uh, sadly uh, passed away in uh, 2001. And uh, certainly the men uh, who were in the yard at the time, and it was men, also there are women now, which is great, uh, but at the time uh, the men were really supportive uh, to our family. And, uh, and I vowed that uh, if I ever had a, had a chance to, to help the yard and to help shipbuilding in Port Glasgow, then I certainly would do that. So in my 11 years uh, in the Scottish Parliament, uh, I have been uh, a continual supporter uh, of uh, Ferguson's as it was, and also Ferguson Marine uh, now. And, uh, and it, it always fills me with, uh, with, a, with a huge amount of pride that, uh, that we still build ships in this town. That's lovely and holding true to the, the promise that you made. But I, I know you also play another role here. I hear that you also pipe when ships are launched from here. Is that right? I do. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of these uh, things that, um, yeah, that it's, an, it's an, an additional thing that a politician does. Uh, I am the, the official parliamentary piper. Uh, but uh, as someone who grew up here in Port Glasgow, I piped at launches when I was a, when I was a boy and, uh, and having that privilege to do it now uh, as MSP uh, is something that, uh, that, that I, I never take for granted and it genuinely is a privilege to do it because to see the, the folk from the town building ships and the ships being launched uh, and the whole town gets behind it and to play that small part as being that piper uh, doing it, it always fills me with joy. It's great. Well, that's lovely, Well, Thank you very much indeed for joining us yeah. here today. Thank you very much. Thank Justina. you. Thank you. Now back to Alex, who's with Jerry Marshall, the CEO of Ferguson Marine. Jerry, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you very much, Alex. Tell me a bit first about the, the history of this great shipyard in the Lower Clyde. Well, Ferguson's, there's been a Ferguson's here since 1903. And you can actually go back to 1790 if you want to look for the first vessel that was actually recorded to be launched in this area. And how many have you done to date? Uh, to date, we've done 360 now. And I mean, when I was last year, there's been a well, there's been a few changes in terms of uh, investment. Yeah. Uh, well, we've now invested. When Clyde Blows Capital came in, the initial investment proposal was 12 and a half million. To date, we're now at 25 million pounds invested in the facility, and that gives you a tremendous uh, capacity to do different things, isn't it? Capacity and capability. Uh, what we're sitting in today now is a state-of-the-art module hall that, that we can now compete very competitively for major work packages throughout the UK and abroad. What's your, what's your key strategy for the future? Key strategy for the future is to still focus on what has been our core work as a ferry market, but we're also diversifying now. We're now looking at Ministry of Defence work, the Type 31E and other projects that go along with that. We're looking at ship repair, we're looking at uh, mobilisation of the workforce, so we're diversifying, but still staying to our core. And many people say that, look, British shipbuilding hasn't been able to compete with low-cost locations. However, in the ferry market, for example, Norway's a very high-cost location. They've been able to compete hugely successfully in some markets. Why is that? I believe if you look at Norway and some other countries, they have investment banks that are set up. And these investment banks work with the shipyards and help them with their working capital. And there's a direct correlation between the market share and your production costs and any subsidies or investment banks. The more you have, the more you can increase your market share and reduce your production costs. And has there been, for example, this question of having to lodge bonds for contracts, is this a, an initiative that the government, Scottish or UK, could take to make our shipyards more competitive? It would definitely, if we had an investment back, it would definitely make us more competitive. Uh, right now we have to go through bonds, and as you can imagine, bonds can be pretty expensive but it's a way of us getting the available working capital. And that ties up your capital. If you have to lodge a bond, your capital is effectively tied Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Now, you're obviously the ferry market is your key, but what is the connection between this shipyard, yeah, building commercial ferries, and Sir John Parker's report on the overall strategy for the industry? 
The Sir John Parker report really kick-started the national shipbuilding strategy. And if you look at the strategy itself, part of that is combining naval shipyards with the commercial shipyards to have a more competitive and competent supply chain in the UK. One that we can use all of the shipyards to the benefit, both of the, the naval and to the benefit of the local communities, the social, the economic and the prosperity that that brings with it. Because a, a shipyard uh, is still a great driver of a local economy, isn't it? Yeah, for definite. If you look here right now within Ferguson, we have around 300 people, but it's the knock-on effect that that has in the local community. Uh, Inverclyde itself has, has been challenged over the years, but with Ferguson here and 300 employees, we're bringing security back to these employees, well-paid, good jobs to the local area, which then gives the, the follow-through for that, people buying houses in the local area, the schools, the local community. If you go down the road now, we now have our Marks and Spencers that's now in the, in the, in the local area, the next. That's uh, one that's opening up. Yes, absolutely, and the retail part down there. So there's a huge benefit. Now you said boys in the yard, but the shipbuilding is changing in terms of its gender characteristics, isn't it? Absolutely, it's fantastic. We now have 35 apprentices, and if you look at those apprentices, eight of them actually happen to be female and they're performing exceptionally well as well and as good and in some most cases better than the boys themselves. Mm. It's just definitely a gender neutral industry. Well, you get a bit of competition going there when oh, you say absolutely, that. absolutely, yes. So listen, you yeah. say you've got 300 uh, employees now. Yeah. Uh, if everything went as you hoped, what is the, the scope of a facility such as this in terms of generating employment? Generate employment through the National Shipbuilding Strategy, we're obviously involved in Type 31E. That's our primary focus just now. Winning a large share of that, the block build off that, would significantly increase the workforce here. Circa 50 to 100 people just with that one contract. Diversifying into ship, ship repair, having dry dock capability, that would then add more workforce to that. And very importantly, the apprenticeships that we would pull through from that securing the future of shipbuilding in Scotland. Now, if I wanted a, a new ferry, what would Ferguson's be able to, to offer me that other yards couldn't? Ferguson's, well, Ferguson's, we pride ourselves on our innovation. We were the first shipyard in 2012 to put the hybrid ferry in the water. The two ferries that you see getting built here just now, the first dual fuel LNG ferries in the UK, and we're currently pioneer the hydrogen fuel cell. So we could offer you a whole array from size to shape and to how you want to drive that, have the, the powertrain behind that. Do you want dual fuel LNG? Do you want battery operated? Or are you wanting hydrogen? Which by 2020, we plan to be the first shipyard in the world having a hydrogen ferry in the water. Now, the, the environment's going to be increasingly important, uh, particularly in terms of the placement of, of ferries. There's a substantial size ferry market in Scotland, but the European ferry market is subject to these same regulations. What are your hopes for that? When, when I look at the ferry market in Scotland, there's over 70 ferries operating in Scotland. Over 51% of them are currently over 20 years old. What I believe we need in Scotland is, an, is a national strategy based on the ferry market, a 20-year programme that we could look out where we could take cost out and pro provide the most efficient and effective ferries that will service the Scottish market. Now, you're already in dual fuel, you're looking forward to perhaps hydrogen powered yeah. ferries in the future, and that would put you really well positioned for the, the ferry market internationally, which is going to have to uh, abide by environmental regulations coming in. Absolutely. If you look at hydrogen, we're, we're aiming for zero emissions, and the ferries that we're currently offering just now, be them battery, be them dual fuel LNG, we're looking to offer uh, an, op an option to upgrade them to hydrogen. So they don't need to replace all the ferries again when we finally get hydrogen through the whole process. We can just upgrade them, giving a zero emission ferry market or ferry service to the whole of Scotland. So the hydrogen fuel cell will finally come into its own in the ferry market? Absolutely. There's a, a, definitely a market there for us and we're driving towards that and Fergus Marine are leading the charge there. Now, in a, in a phrase, shipbuilding in the, in the lower Clyde, sunrise or sunset industry? Definitely sunrise. Jerry Marshall, thank you so much for the interview. Thank you very much, Alex. Now, coming up after the break, we'll be speaking to some of the workers who are absolutely determined to maintain that great tradition of shipbuilding here in the Lower Clyde. Welcome back. 
Now, back in 2014, things looked pretty desperate for Ferguson's here in the, the lower Clyde. Uh, and then I got inveigled with a, a couple of guys who were the, the key shop stewards campaigning to save the yard. So, John, Alec, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thanks, Alec. Thanks, Alec. Now, think back to 2014 when you were leading that campaign. I mean, things were pretty dark in terms of the future. Probably the darkest day I had in Ferguson was that day. We had grown men crying, apprentices were distraught. We had absolutely no future in liquidation, and it seemed as though it was finished. And between you and, uh, and John here, you've done a fair spell here at Ferguson's. Long time. Uh, a long time. Long time. And, you know, as the shop stewards, I mean, obviously it was your obligation, your duty to, to mount the campaign. Did you think it was going to be successful? No, in a nutshell. You never tell me that. Definitely. Well, at the time, Alec, when we come in the, the Friday morning, and we knew something was afoot, uh, obviously, with the weeks previous, when we come in that Friday morning and to be taken up there with administrators and told basically you'd half an hour to leave. Half an hour? Half an hour to pack your stuff and leave the yard. And as John said, I was one of the grown men that was crying. I've been here a long, long time. The uh, local community is. Uh, Family worked in here as well. My brothers, my nephew, as everybody in this yard had family that worked in here at the time. It's a very family orientated yard, and it was devastating at that time, especially for Port Glasgow and for the shipbuilding community in the Lower Clyde. So, John, you're you facing not just the loss of jobs and livelihoods, but the loss of history and heritage as well. Uh -huh. uh, everything we'd fought for really over well, 20 odd years I was here, we'd fought, we'd been on bare weeks, we had no work, management kept us on and it had all gone in that one split second. So when I, I came to the yard uh, uh, as First Minister then, I, I was struck, how shall I put this, uh, as delicately as I can, by the, the antique nature of some of the equipment here. I'm not talking about the guys mm. and the, the workforce, and I'm talking about the machinery. I mean, I think uh, it was maybe yourself who said it was like the antiques roadshow. I think we walked in the top, the top shed that day, Alec, and you remarked on it, my God, do you, do you build ships with these things here? It was the antique roadshow, the cranes. As you can see now, it's all different. Yeah, it's quite a transformation. So as people see the investment coming into that, that must give you a, a kind of bounce for the future now. It definitely does. It gives the whole local community of Port Glasgow a bounce for the future. And with the apprentices that the company are taking on now, it's the big, big thing. Uh, shipbuilding is an ageing workforce, and we've got to bring these kids through, get the apprentices trained up. Because once you lose these skills in shipbuilding, they're in trouble. The shipbuilding will be a dying trade, but we are reviving the dying trade now, and the apprentices are the future of the shirt. I see the gender balance is changing a it's bit. It's changing, the aye. Is there any changes in behaviour that have to go with that? Aye, aye. You've met Kirsty and you've met Louise, haven't you? Oh, we talk about that every day of the week. <laughs> good thing, too. Aye, good thing, aye. And so, as you look to the future, but where, where do you think uh, this yard's going, I mean, in terms of uh, the, the, the prospects? Well, well no management is... Defence work is key for us at the moment. But to achieve that, Alec, we really need some help from a UK government who's been totally intransigent. I mean, a recent GMB study proved that if they place a 100 million order with a Scottish or a British yard, 330 million come back into the UK Treasury. The shipbuilding's always been a great driver of the economy, not just in terms of local content, but also in terms of the taxation generated by the, uh -huh. the jobs and livelihoods sustained. And this is a town that badly needs it, Alec. We need the kick-on jobs that Ferguson will provide as we move forward to stimulate the town again up Port Glasgow and Gourock. And what had the Glen Sannox, of course, was uh, launched last year. That must have been some day for the, the town and the workforce to see a, a boat uh, moving off the, the slipway again. Well, it certainly was. It's uh, probably the biggest ship that this yard has ever built. Uh, as you know, a bit more traditionally, it was small ferries, tugs, uh, kind of fishery protection boats that we had been built. As John Wrightley says, we're looking to move into defence work now, and this is where it's going to be key, because that's a long-term longevity that this company needs, and this is what the future for the industry needs, is these solid fleet support boats. And the UK government, I've got to, no, none of this political, we've got to put it out, European tender, I've got to do it. This has got to be built in Britain. It must be built in Britain for all these shipyards and the communities around the country. Now, you've agreed, uh, guys, on your joint campaign to, to save the yard and the future of the workforce, but you don't absolutely agree on everything no. when it comes to the beautiful game. Uh, no. And your team's been having just a wee bit more success than your team, or for that matter, my team. I'm enjoying the sunshine, Alec, and the lack of phone calls from you. <laughs> because I remember you called me one day when Hearts were beating Celtic. 
I couldn't get you when I called you back when it finished up we won. Well, it was that 4 0 game, which I wasn't going to okay, mention, okay. but nonetheless. And you see a revival in the prospects of uh, of your team uh, to equal the revival in Ferguson's Green at Morton. <laughs> <laughs> no, you mean the Rangers? Ah, well, a new manager coming in, so you just watch your backers' team, they'll be invincible no more. Right, so, well, well, I mean, as you both are going to have to be aware that this shipyard will be here for many years to come, but hopefully it's hearts that are going to win the league. Oh, well, <laughs> someday. <laughs> Listen, uh, over to Tasmina, who's been uh, speaking to some more of the workforce. Thank you, Alex. I'm now joined by Hugh McKenzie and Kirsty Graham, the longest serving and newest member of the Ferguson family. Welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Now, Hugh, you've been here for quite a wee spell. How long have you been at Ferguson's? Well, really, since I left school, I've been here some, like, 33 years. 33 years, that's quite a long stint. And yourself, Kirsty? Just over a year. So you're, you're the new kid on the block. Yeah. What's it like at Ferguson's? It's great, there's lots to learn, the people are brilliant as well. And what have you been doing to you in all of those 33 years? Have you been in the same role or have you moved through different roles? Well, like Kirsty, I came in as a young fabricator and uh, went through various roles in the yard, from te through the techni technical departments, shop floor, and then out into the management team, which is the role I'm currently doing. And uh, how many more years do you think you've got in shipbuilding? Uh, probably not a good 20 years in there yet. What about you, Kirsty? How, you, how are you enjoying your apprenticeship and what do you think the future holds for you? Uh, hopefully, moving up the chain here, there's lots to learn. There's so many opportunities, especially with the yard newly opened. And do you have family in, in shipbuilding? Uh, no, I'm the first. <laughs> You're the very first one. And what's it like being a, being a young female amongst a predominantly male workforce here? There's no inequality at all. Everyone's great. It's like a big family. Everyone treats you the same. And you, what do you think about sort of more women coming into the industry? Obviously, it's something that's welcomed at Ferguson's. This is something I know. Surely, it's good for the industry. Oh, it's as a absolutely whole. brilliant. I mean, I, I mean, engineering in general, we need to get more females into engineering. I've got two daughters myself, and I'm trying to encourage them to get into some sort of engineering role. Fantastic. Now, many people have spoken that shipbuilding is very much family orientated. It feels like you're one big family. How do you feel the future of shipbuilding is important to the maintenance of that family and of course all of the people in the wider community who benefit from that? Hugh, first of all. That's absolutely crucial. I mean, every, every, every pound that's spent at Ferguson benefits the whole place round about Port Glasgow and Greenwich. So it's crucial that we, we keep work here and we keep this type of commercial awareness we have here. So Christy, it must be like you've already said, a big, a big family for you. Do you feel now that your future even from a family perspective, it's now ingrained here at, at Ferguson's. Yeah, I really enjoy it here. And you're going to encourage more young women to enter the workforce? Definitely. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Kirsty. Of course, Kirsty isn't the only female employee here at Ferguson Marine. Alex is speaking to Louise Larkin. Now, one of our themes as we've looked at the future of Ferguson's is commenting on the changing gender balance in the workforce of the yard. And I'm now joined by one of the apprentices, Louise Larkin. So uh, how long have you got to do before you complete your apprenticeship here? Just three months now. I'm nearly finished. I'm in my final year here. The apprentices in Scotland are fully part of the workforce, of course, but you'll get paid a fair bit more if you're continuing here in the yard afterwards, won't you? Definitely, yeah. Our wages will go up a lot. <laughs> well, that's something good to look forward to, but you're in the drawing office, aren't you? I am, yeah. So you'll be planning out the, the future projects. Yeah, uh... we'll be planning and designing and drawing. And what's, I mean, what's it like? I mean, did you think uh, that you are going to see your career as, as part of this shipyard? It's a... Not when I was really young. I did want to be an engineer when I was younger, but I didn't really have the confidence to go for it until I was a wee bit older. Then, once I grew up a bit, I went to college and done a couple of years of engineering. Then when I seen that Ferguson's were hiring, I didn't think twice in applying, and I was really lucky to get the apprenticeship. Because you're local to here, aren't you? I am. I just stay in Greenock, which isn't far, yeah. My first year on the yard, I was an engineer. Then at the start of my second year, I was offered a place in the drawn office. Mm -hmm. So you'll be, uh, you'll be looking very much at the, the future of what's to come in this yard in the drawing office. Definitely. I'm really excited to where the yard's going. I'm really excited to grow with the yard. And in terms of your own personal development, I mean, this articulation where you can do your apprenticeship as a fully-fledged worker in the yard doing the apprenticeship, but also develop your, your skills. I mean, mm -hmm. I understand you're doing an HND now. Yep, I am. That's one of the opportunities that I've been given. Before I started in Ferguson's, I had gained an NC and HNC. So when it came, I came to Ferguson's, they pushed me to advance myself onto an HND. So if I could just wave a magic wand and say, listen, what is the ship that you would like to be working on in the drawing office, drawing up the plans for? What, what kind of ship would you like to do? Maybe a hydrogen vessel, because I think hydrogen might be the future. 
And this is the technology, clean burn technology. So you've got, is, you're screaming yeah. away at uh, mm -hmm. making a reality of what's been like the holy grail of uh, hydrogen powered boats. Yep, it's really exciting. And I think Ferguson's is going to be the place to take it forward. So I'm going to be right there with it. So from your perspective, Shipbuilding here in Greenock at Ferguson is very much a, an industry of the future. Definitely, and it's really good for the town. It's good that it's in Inverclyde, and if we take on local workers as Ferguson's is doing, it's keeping the jobs in Inverclyde, which is really important to the town. Louise Larkin, thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. This has been a great place to climax our series on the future of British shipbuilding. This yard was set for closure only four years ago. Now it's every prospect of much brighter times to come. Ferguson's is a builder of commercial ferries, but even here we've heard the familiar refrain that a guaranteed flow of order from the military is an essential prerequisite of building that baseline to allow the yard to compete in commercial markets. Now crucial to that decision and the consortium which are being formed to bid for it is the upcoming decision on the support ships for the carriers. Since the first programme in our series, Babcocks have announced a strategic partnership with BAE Systems to compete for that vital and huge order. Here at Ferguson's, they know they have to be part of these consortium, part of that partnership, if they are to build their base load to allow them to compete effectively in the international ferry market. One thing's for certain, in each of the yards we've visited over the past few weeks, in Resaif, in Belfast, and here in the Clyde, there are communities who are committed to building ships. They see their industry as part of the sunrise, not of the sunset. For Tanzmina, myself, the crew, it's goodbye for now. And of course, from everyone here at Ferguson's yeah! on the Clyde. <laughs>